fleeing with the Argives and restoring Jason's father's youth with her magic. Mm. So what exactly happens in Euripides Medea? Um, following the events of previously established mythology, Medea has fled her homeland with Jason and gone to live with him in the Greek city of Corinth. And she discovers that Jason is planning to leave her and marry the young princess of Corinth. So she devises a plan to flee to Athens, but before she does, she murders the princess, murders the king, and kills her two sons with Jason out of revenge. So she leaves him in Corinth with no heirs, no wife, and no power. So the question that I wanted to explore here is how do we understand the mindset of a woman who kills her children? It's not easy. <laughs> Um, but if we look at the context and the background of her story, we can start to see um, Euripides' play as being about Medea reclaiming her power. So first of all, Medea is a witch with divine heritage and immense power. Without her, Jason's acts of heroism would not have succeeded. The only reason he's able to acquire the Golden Fleece is because she gives him the power to do so with her magic. But once she reaches Greece with Jason, she must adhere to Greek laws regarding marriage. So she's, in, she's confined entirely to the household and she's not considered a citizen of the state. So she goes from wielding unbound divine power to living as a housewife with no agency. We see a quote from Ovid's Metamorphoses here, which um, describes her power. She says, I make whole forests move by my command. The mountains tremble and the deep earth groans and spirits of the dead come from their tombs. And then we have a quote from Euripides' tragedy when she says, a man, when he becomes annoyed with the company of those inside, can go outside and stop his heart's distress. We must look to only one other person. I'd rather stand three times behind a shield than bear a child once. So another element of Medea's identity, which is erased through her marriage to Jason, is her cultural identity. So she suffers not only under the patriarchal structures in Greece, but under the xenophobic culture of Jason's home. She suffers countless microaggressions throughout Euripides tragedy due to her nationality, including from Jason himself, who tells her at one point that she should be grateful that he rescued her from a barbaric land. So she's unable to access her magic, unable to enjoy the freedoms she had in her previous life, and unable to access the culture of her homeland as Jason's wife. Essentially, she has been stripped entirely of an identity separate from her husband. So Euripides' play is Medea fighting back. It's her reclaiming her identity. And her act of revenge on Jason marks the first time in her story that she uses her powers for herself, not to further his own success. And she openly relishes being able to access these powers, even sadistically, because we know in Greek mythology that goddesses are known to be cruel. So her ultimate decision to kill her children represents her complete transformation into the demigoddess, severing herself from Jason permanently and reclaiming her own identity. The final scene of the tragedy, which we can see here um, being performed, it's Medea in her grandfather Helios' chariot soaring above the stage. So she's transformed into the goddess completely and reclaimed her identity from Jason. One of the final exchanges they have together in the play, he asks her, do you really think it proper to kill them because of the marriage bed? To which she responds, do you think that this is small suffering for a woman? So, this is where I leave you. I leave you with a quote from a sort of modern day Medea, Amy Dunn from Gone Girl, which is a great film and you should all watch it, um, who accuses her cheating husband of murder. She says, he took from me until I no longer existed. That's murder. Let the punishment fit the crime. So yeah, that's, that's my presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. That was awesome. Great PowerPoint, too. We love visuals. <laughs> Is Emma here? I haven't been able to get a hold of her. I tried calling her, so um, if she shows up, we will see. Um, and I'll just be watching to make sure that she's not trying to reach out. Okay, then we'll skip ahead, um, and Hannah Anwar is next. Um, she's a junior English major and writing center tutor. She lives in Uptown and enjoys exploring and writing about the neighborhood in her free time. Okay, this is a prose poem I wrote for Mark Turcotte's class. Um, it's called Prayer for My Mother. I'm just gonna read it. Um, Don't do what they say, girl. Take the mundane and suck its rich marrow. Live in solitude paradise. 
crush carpet, carpet cockroaches, fix your sink, smoke out the window, delight in roadside oaks and thrifted suede, depend on your calloused hands, watch friends marry in dead-eye mists of money confetti, read Marx, marry for love, and after decades of gut-driven glory, find yourself behind the register, birthday card, tangerines, dish soap. Your wrist howls from tearing receipts, collapse on the sofa, learn your son hasn't been at school. Know the friend who married money is a cadaver in her well-made bed. Your husband slurs at the cat from the guest room and still you touch shoulders of old ladies alone at the checkout. Save a seat for your widowed coworker. Sorry, I think I froze. <laughs> All right, so that, <laughs> no one moved there for a second. So just wanted to make sure we're not interrupting you. When did I cut out? I'm just I Maybe I cut out? I don't know. <laughs> she cut out for me as well, so I don't know if everyone else got the same thing. Okay. <laughs> Do you know where I cut out, Amelia? I think the last word you said was coworker. Yeah. Um, should I? It's really short. I could just read it again. If Go for it. Sure. <laughs> I could also share my screen if anyone wants to look at it. I think that would be helpful. Okay. Let me try. Do you know how to do that? <laughs> Caitlin might have to give you permission. You, you should have permission right now. There's just at the bottom of your screen, there's like a little arrow pointing up. It just says Wonder. share screen. Got it. Okay. Does everyone see it? Not yet. You'll have to select the. the Do I share screen. application or desktop? Do you know? Um, probably the application. I got it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Does everyone see it? Is that good? We can see it, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, prayer for my mother. Don't do what they say, girl. Take the mundane and suck its rich marrow. Live in solitude paradise. Crush carpet cockroaches. Fix your sink. Smoke out the window. Delight in roadside oaks and thrifted suede. Depend on your calloused hands. Watch friends marry in dead-eye mists of money confetti. Read Marx, marry for love. And after decades of gut-driven glory, find yourself behind the register. Birthday card, tangerines, dish soap. Your wrist howls from tearing receipts. Collapse on the sofa. Learn your son hasn't been at school. Know the friend who married money is a cadaver in her well-made bed. Your husband slurs at the cat from the guest room. And still, you touch shoulders of old ladies alone at the checkout. Save a seat for your widowed coworker. Stand on your rotting deck to admire the swollen moon. Thanks. Awesome. There we got the end. That was very helpful to see it, too, I think. I have a hard time processing as I'm hearing. Great. So we will come back to questions um, for everyone after we have, did we find Emma? No? <laughs> no, Emma. All right, then we'll go to Isabel Cartwright next. Um, Isabel is a psychology major with minors in English literature and history. She loves reading and rock climbing, and this is her first year at DePaul. Hi, um, okay, so I, I wrote a literary analysis paper and it's about two books, Lure Blue by Alicia Gabbert and Favorite Country by Rose Tremaine. Um, Lure Blue is a collection of poems from the perspective of uh, Judy from uh, Wallace Shawn's The Designated Mourner and Sacred Country is a novel about um, uh, the character of Martin Ward who is a boy born into a girl's body. Um, and it takes place, uh, Sacred Country takes place in uh, 1950s England, spans the 60s, and then ends in 1970s America. 
Oh, so I'm going to read my introduction and then I'm going to read two pieces of um, analysis that I've selected from my body paragraph and then I'm going to read the conclusion of my paper. Okay, uh, it's called Coping with uh, Life, Irony, Paradox, and Negative Capability in Exploring Gender. Um, okay, 500 bricks are on a plane. One falls off, how many are left? Joe begins one of the longest and most pointless jokes in human history, involving six or seven questions that laboriously arrive at a violent and upsetting conclusion. There's something poignant about its simplicity. The intuitive answer that you're supposed to give is that there are 499 bricks left, echoing those elementary level math questions, the ones that had real life applications and too many bottles of dish soap. The 500th brick ceases to be important. Existence continues unperturbed with the other ones. Within that question, a world is created and divided into being and not being, where being is assumed to be continuous and not being is assumed to be irrelevant. What makes this process of categorization, this creation of binaries, so intuitive and so comfortable? Perhaps it is because these categories are easy to understand. They simplify a confusing world into the immediate concern. They allow humans to avoid confronting the unexplainable, the ghost. By splitting the world into brick and not brick, the essential information is retained and the superfluous information is discarded. The questions can be answered and life can go on. This is not good enough for Elisa Gabbard and Rose Tremaine. In their books blur blue and sacred country, the audience is asked to consider for a moment the plight of the 500 brick, hanging in the space between binaries. The main characters, Judy and Lord Blue and Martin in sacred country, do not quite fit in the boxes that they are supposed to fit into. Judy tries to be a good wife and daughter, but finds it profoundly alienating. Martin is sure that somebody along the way made a mistake when they put him into a girl's body. To explore these experiences that exist outside the norm, Gabbard and Tremaine rely on paradox and irony. These literary techniques illustrate how binaries and categories fail to encompass the full range of human experience, arguing instead that negative capability, the ability to see each other in all of our contradictions, is necessary to meaningfully understand one another. All right, this is a selection, uh, this is a bit of analysis of uh, Gabbard's After a Seizure. The imagery of this poem contradicts itself. It often states a thing and then immediately zags to another paradoxical thing. For example, my eigenbrow isn't gray, it's red. Um, the mind zags diagonal. Note the diagonally, the physical diagonality of zag. The Z represents visually the diagonal path of the mind. The poem is filled with jagged lines and harsh, sound, harsh sounds. The Z sound comes from the title, after a seizure. This is an example of consonants. These lines and sounds fight against the idea that beauty has to be sexy or appealing. They are discordant and unexpected. Beauty deals with her grief, and it makes her hard to be around. OK. Um, all right, this is from uh, Martin, the story about Martin's sacred country. When uh, Martin is talking to her, his grandfather, Cord, he says everything important in life is dual, like being and not being, um, male and female, and that there's no country in between. I, Martin, sat on the toilet and looked at John, and he looked at me with empty eyes, and I thought, Cord is wrong. There is a country in between, a country that no one sees, and I am in it. In Martin's character, Tremaine forces the audience to be negatively capable. Martin, Mary slash Martin defies categorization. He is not black, a uh, black and white character like John Wayne that the audience can take comfort in. Normally people can get away with not worrying about people who don't fit in categories. By making her main character a person who doesn't fit, Tremaine makes the audience reconsider the meaningfulness of categorization. And finally, this is a lesson from my conclusion. Alicia Gabbard and Rose Tremaine are simply saying that those who, those who do not fit should not be ignored. As in the stories of Martin and Judy, violence, alienation, and pain arise naturally from living in a world where assumptions are not questioned. There's too much unknown, too much ambiguity to pretend that everything is explainable, at least for now. That, is the, that understanding of the world sacrifices too much for the sake of, a, of an illusory stability. In reality, you're never safe from, safe from a falling brick. Thing. Okay. All right. Thank you, Isabel. Um, and I believe Emma crept in there, right? Yep, there you are. <laughs> Hi. Sorry. I realized I was on the 
wrong Zoom and someone was in the middle of reading and I didn't, I wanted to finish um, hearing their, <laughs> their stuff. So that was my bad, sorry. <laughs> All right, so it's okay. We still have time for you. So this is Emma Mayers. Um, she is a senior majoring in environmental studies and English lit studies. Um, her paper for the English conference is a research project she completed with the Newberry Seminar. In, uh, in this course, she studies Shakespeare's influence after his death, analyzing various archival materials provided by the Newberry. She hopes to continue both humanities and scientific research, as well as work towards making academic research more accessible. All right, Emma. All right. Um, I have a PowerPoint, so I can share my screen, or I can just speak if that's all right. So I don't know what the protocol is. Is everyone fine with me sharing my screen or? Yeah, okay. we've been doing that. Awesome. Um, all right, I don't know. Here we go. All right, I'm just gonna put this in present. Oh, whoops. Okay, can everyone see that well? Okay, great. So uh, my name is Emma Maris and uh, for my paper, I worked on an analysis of different literary and performative um, editions of Shakespeare's Macbeth between the year 1650 and 1850. And um, I, I worked mostly with the Newberry. So a lot of the sources here were sources I interacted with uh, before things had shut down, but some were online. Um, so, for my paper, I engage with a number of historical documents, including plays, books, playbills, and illustrations that were significant in reflecting the contemporary and political cultural climates between the mid-17th century to the mid-19th century. Um, through artistic and authorial intentions, um, though they changed throughout these pieces, uh, there was an underlying theme that um, I was fascinated by. One, that female authority in the play, uh, specifically the characters of Lady Macbeth and the witches, um, were usually changed or engaged with in unique ways. And I'm, they often sought to depict female power as corruptive or dangerous to patriarchal systems, which was really interesting because it was a theme that was carried throughout all these alterations. Um, there's a bunch of scholarly conversation around this topic already. People are very fascinated by the witches in Macbeth. Um, Names like Marilyn French, Robert Kimbrough, Anne Hermanson, Ayanna Thompson, and Stephen Greenblatt have all kind of pitched into this scholarly debate, kind of deciding how the witches play a role and how femininity is important to this play. Um, one of the most fascinating historical documents I found was um, this satire. Um, it had a very interesting history, actually. So the original, um, the Macbeth appeared in a farce of this play, The Empress of Morocco, and there was an interesting history behind the original play. Um, so Thomas de Faye's parody of it has an epilogue with an appearance of Macbeth at the very end, but it was actually a parody meant to kind of push down uh, Elkanah Settle's success, which I found really interesting, and it had already been dealing with themes of um, like English politics, but they were doing it in, they were displacing it in Morocco, which was, it's already a fascinating work on its own. And then the placement of Macbeth at the end of it in the parody was also um, an interesting little tidbit. I could talk a lot more about this, but there are several sources that I go through. Um, but this was definitely something from the Newberry that I found was, oh, did I just exit? Oh dear, sorry. So it was definitely something I found fascinating um, while going through, because there is, um, in, the, in the parody at the very end, it's only a scene with the witches. Lady Macbeth is not mentioned. It's only the women kind of casting um, spells, and it's supposed to be made parody or parodied. Another really interesting source that I had found was The Three Conjurers, and it was really hard finding um, research on this that was already done. Um, there were only a few papers that had referenced the Three Conjurers, so it was very interesting um, material to interact with. Um, and I ask here, how does Macbeth become part of the riots against the Cider Bill of 1763? Because this parody was based, um, it was altered so that it could reflect this um, kind of political uprising between 
uh, these two men that I have in these images here. Um, so it's between John Wilkes Booth, uh, John, sorry, not John Wilkes Booth, John Wilkes shown on the right and um, the MP shown on the left. So there were issues with a new bill being proposed um, and people were upset about taxes and somehow Macbeth kind of made its way into the history. Um, and it's, in a, it's really fascinating because they kind of play on the word instead of which it's called conjurer. Um, and you see at the end, instead of Lady Mac Beth and Macbeth, they're called Macboot, which is meant to play on words of politicians who were present um, in, seven, in the 1760s. And then at the very end, Macboot flies off with Hecate. So it's a very weird ending and it's a very weird play. Um, when the Newbury <laughs> opens up again, I advise everyone, they should go check it out because it was super weird. Um, so that was one really interesting source. And then also what was really interesting, there were, there were several travesties both in the US, or there was a travesty in the US and a travesty in England that are actually quite similar. And they were published um, about the same time. So a travesty comes from the French word uh, travesty directly translating to disguise or to dress up. So it's often in a comical way, but often when going through these texts, it often, um, it could be very sexist and very racist. So these versions of Macbeth were definitely meant to play on the witches being kind of these androgynous characters. Um, and they parodied m mainly the women. Um, so it's interesting that in the, this, these were published in the 1840s, the late 1840s into the 1850s. So it's interesting that the previous sources that were coming from the 17th and 18th centuries that this trope is still being played with, it's even played with today. Um, but often the women were a point of interest. There are also musical renditions of Macbeth. So Sir William de Avenant, so we're going back in history a little bit to the 17th century, um, but this was performed into the 18th century. This musical adaptation, it was kind of operatic. It was meant to be um, kind of bigger or boisterous um, than other performances. It's not really until later that actors decide to change up this um, kind of performance of the play and want to make it more realist. Um, but the alterations in the songs that are included are also very focused on the witches, which was fascinating because it's like, um, again, playing into tropes of sex and gender and sexuality and being hypersexual. Um, and even Lady Macbeth has moments of singing. Um, there's also a scene between Lady Macbeth and Lady Macduff where it's kind of trying to juxtapose Lady Macduff as the ideal woman and Lady Macbeth as the evil woman, which isn't seen in the original version. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of people contest the music in Shakespeare's first folio. So it's, it was really interesting seeing this adaptation being used, um, kind of to use music in this way. And then it was performed for quite some time. I also discussed Sarah Siddons. So the way my paper is structured is kind of listing all of these different sources um, and discussing how femininity is kind of a point to be made. It, it's a point that's parodied often. And um, in most cases, uh, these parodies are used to show a political regime and how women are kind of infiltrating it and kind of making it go wrong. Um, and sometimes that's comedic or most of the time that is comedic um, in these renditions, but Sarah Siddons was someone, was a famous actress who kind of redefined, redefined the role of Lady Macbeth in the 18th century. So she kind of, she made Lady Macbeth a more humane and human character, because um, often, I mean, when you read Macbeth, she is often evil. <laughs> but Siddons balanced characteristics of femininity and terror, which hadn't been done before. So um, when people saw her perform this, they, they almost sided with her and they were intrigued by her, um, her ability to captivate audiences. Um, so the way my, my paper is structured is, though the witches and Lady Macbeth are roles and characters that are often parodied and ridiculed or shown as examples of how female power can go wrong, it's fascinating how performance can kind of play with that, um, especially Sarah Siddons was described as a genius by her contemporaries, so the power and performance was significant um, 
in this case. And I think what I could do with my paper is show how performance, um, if we are continue, if we continue to uh, perform this play, kind of how do we interact with the long history of kind of parodying women and female power, um, and then balance it with continuing to perform this play and maybe Sarah Siddons can be a point for us to look at um, when teaching this play or performing this play. And then because I was part of this course that was a major question was why Shakespeare? Um, what I learned was these historical documents demonstrate how Shakespeare's reach extends beyond his original plays and how people have continued to perform Shakespeare after his death. There were several other forms of theatrical and literary and artistic interaction through parodies or illustrations or whatever it was, because people were just fascinated by these plays. Um, and we still, we still are. Um, but because of these very various interactions with Shakespeare throughout English history, we cannot separate Shakespeare from the political cultural moments. So even if we don't love Shakespeare um, and maybe his messages in these plays or how they become messages in alterations, they're important to interact with um, as English critics and historians and possible actors and performers. So I kind of wrap up the end of this paper. It's a, the brunt of it is a depiction of how um, renditions were not kind towards women, but at the same time, it's important us to remember that if we're gonna continue speaking about this play as academics or as writers or as teachers. Um, so that was, that's my paper in a nutshell. I hope I didn't go over five minutes, but <laughs> thank you for listening. Thank you, Emma. All right. So we do have time for some questions. Um, I'm actually going to open up to the audience first, and if no one has anything, then I'll start asking mine. Audience members, would you like to grill our panelists? I have a question. Um, obviously, most of these were literary analysis and research papers, but for all of you, I was just kind of wondering what your writing process for these went looked like, um, how you started out maybe with an idea or a concept and it developed into this larger piece? Great question. Maybe just go in order. Sarah, do you want to start? Um, so I chose this topic because I wanted to try to come up with an argument for something that seemed like kind of inarguable because Medea is like, she commits one of the worst crimes that we could even think of. A woman killing her own children is brutal. Um, but there was something, like, empowering about her character anyway as I was reading the play. Um, so I wanted to find a way to kind of get inside of her head and figure out how I could, like, reframe it. Um, and it ended up being, I think, a little bit more straightforward than I was expecting. But basically, I, I did a whole lot of thinking at first. Um, because I was really afraid that my paper was going to end up sounding like <laughs> murder is fine, you know, like, which I did not want my argument to sound like. So it took a minute, but I just, yeah, I, I read the play a few times. I looked over some sources and I just sort of like thought a lot about it and how I wanted to frame it before I actually started to write it. Hannah, what about you? Yeah, um, I tend to write poems about uptown in my apartment, um, like from an observer standpoint. And I was talking to one of my friends and she's like, mentioned that I rarely um, get really personal in my poems. So I wanted to challenge myself uh, to do that. Um, and it, it took me a long time to figure out how to enter it. Um, Cause I'm so used to writing as the observer. Um, and even like, even just the title is what makes it personal, like you might not know I was writing about my mom. Um, so I thought that was interesting to me, like navigating that, because it's different from my usual writing process. Fascinating. Um, Isabel, what about you? Um, uh, so I think 
what I write about obviously reflects what I'm uh, thinking about like in my life, I guess. And at that time I was taking a class uh, called Psychology and Social Justice that was exploring the ways that people form groups and think about groups and how that um, sort of oppression gets like internalized in, in certain people and how, uh, how very uh, essential the process of categorization is to um, to just like daily life being a human. Um, so that was the seed that I think really sparked the whole uh, looking at paradox and how um, these women were and these this woman and this uh, transgender person were exploring their own um, trying to find their own identity that was unique from the whole um, uh, binary categorization type thing. Yeah. Great. And Emma, what about you? Um, this research project was the most like it was the most different kind of research I've ever experienced because I was doing it with like firsthand archival materials and it was a very long paper for me like I it ended up being like 27 pages which for me is like the longest paper I've ever written so it was really like um, it was a fascinating process about kind of like figuring out how to hone my main thesis uh, so that I could carry it out through through each of these examples, because the stuff that I mentioned in the slide, that's only like a fraction of the stuff that I ended up looking at. Um, so, and it was also a long period of history. So between 1650 and 1850. So there was a lot of like, um, I just had to stay focused about what I was trying to say and also kind of like adapting with the material I was looking at. Um, but altogether it was, it was really interesting and it taught me a lot about how to go about research in the future, whether it's big research or small research. So, yeah. Really interesting from all of you. Um, anyone else in the audience have any questions? Or panelists for each other, you're welcome to chime in too. Let's see, I have my questions. Um, for both Emma and Sarah, since you guys are dealing with plays, um, do you think that these, both of these plays can be staged as written in a feminist way? Um, since they both have very problematic kind of histories um, in their representations of women, they both give us kind of famous sort of demonized women um, without the play, you know, without us adapting them as Emma, you looked at so many different adaptations or parodies. Um, if we take the actual author's original texts, can they be performed, do you think, in a way that we would perceive as feminist? Um, I think that Euripides Medea, it can be staged in a feminist way because I think that in on one level Euripides is sort of empathizing with Medea as he's writing because the end of the play in which she's transformed into a goddess like she's got the god's approval for what she's done because they've claimed her as one of their own at that point um Helios has sent his chariot to her or whatever you know so um, in that sense, I think in a way he's asking us to sort of understand her suffering and what she went through. And I also think the fact that one of the last lines in the play is her responding to Jason, um, do you think this is small suffering for a woman is one of like the last things that she says before the play ends. So I think that, yeah, I think it actually wouldn't be that hard to stage a feminist um, version of it because I think a lot of it is in the text already. Fascinating. What about you, Emma? How would you do this? Yeah, I have a, I have a complicated relationship with Shakespeare after coming out of this course, because um, a lot of what we looked at was performance. And I think that, I think that it is possible, um, but I do have a bit of, I'm hesitant also with kind of, um, and I hope this isn't problematic, but like, I don't think that we need to preserve Shakespeare's words always because just looking at the history of like his afterlife, even we're not even sure of what his, especially with Macbeth, like the songs were in certain, uh, were inserted um, 
perhaps by somebody else. So it's like, it's already a play where the authorship is kind of contested. So it kind of puts us as 21st century readers and writers and performers in a tricky spot. Um, so I, I feel like my answer is I'd, I'd be interested in changing the language a little bit, um, especially to make it more of a feminist performance or reading. But at the same time, based on your question, if we were to keep it as it is, I have seen very interesting and unique like ways of performing sexist lines. So I think there is a way to do it, but I'm also in a school that's like, I'd be happy to change Shakespeare because that's a way to keep it alive. And, or at least that's my perspective is to just alter it. Um, especially doing a big research project on alteration. And I was fascinated by how people changed it re to reflect the contemporary period or politics that people were existing in, but yeah. <laughs> awesome. I have, as a Victorianist, a very specific question, it's just for me. Um, these ones from the 80, 1840s and 50s, these travesties, um, do you know what who the original audience was? Were these like music hall performances? Were they for the working classes or? They seem very, I don't know, uh, I guess low for a proper upper class audience. That's for Emma. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so it's interesting. So are you talking about like the travesties and stuff? Yeah, 40s and 50s. Yeah, so actually the, those were some of the most like, yeah, they were, I, I say this about every source that I interact with being like, this is the most interesting piece. But um, yeah, the travesties were really interesting because a lot of them or the ones that I looked at had introductions saying like, this wasn't meant to be any sort of literary like um, authority. It's actually just for performance. And a lot of these renditions were used to kind of keep theaters alive. Even um, like the re Thomas DeFay's rendition of Elkanah Settle's play where Macbeth appears at the end, it was kind of like a feud between theaters. So I think there were different um, interactions with it. Like a lot of, I think a lot of people were viewing these and it wasn't just kind of, um, it wasn't always just contained for like wealthy patrons, um, like the travesties especially, whereas other things were, um, which actually makes it even more interesting to read now because you're thinking, okay, who's watching this and like who's interacting with it. Um, and definitely it changes over time. Um, and I think something else that was super interesting was just kind of learning how like how much Shakespeare is used everywhere because while looking at all these alterations it wasn't just plays and it wasn't just um, illustrations it could be anything from like ads to just Shakespeare was commonplace kind of everywhere so does that answer kind of your question yeah I would love to look at those just to see yeah. them I'm so curious what They're actually a lot of them are online like they've been moved to archive.org and I got really lucky in looking at them, so I would be happy to share links. Awesome, yeah, I would love to see that. Um, Hannah, I had a question for you, and this is a personal question. I'm just really curious, um, does, has your mom read your poem? Yeah, I sent it to her after I wrote it. I just wanna know what she thought about it, and she really liked it. Um, so that, that's good. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I didn't, I always wonder about, you know, biographical stuff or autobiographical, if, if that would be, you know, a point of contention, if you're kind of interpreting her, right? Right. Well, I think I wanted to speak to, like, not just my mom's experience, but like a female experience of, um, you know, no matter what you do, if, if you take the beaten path or you take the unbeaten path, you can often still get stuck in your life like regardless, um, often with women like staying home to raise their children, that ends up happening when they when they leave their job to raise their kids. Um, so I wanted to emphasize like um, still holding on to your sense of self um, and your sense of wonderment at life in spite of that, which I feel like my mom talks about a lot. So yeah. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like your mom's an amazing person. Thanks. Um, and Isabel, I have one more question, unless anyone else wants to jump in. Um, I am not familiar at all with the poems that you're writing about. And this is, you know, everyone, all of my students here know that I'm not a poetry person. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about these? Because they sound really interesting, and I think other people might want to explore them, um, you know, based on what you've told us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, these were for uh, intro to lit class. So um, 
uh, the the um, Lord Blue is subtitled the Judy Poems. It's Alisa Gabbard, and um, is I I'm not actually familiar with the play that it's based on, but yeah, it's um uh, a very it was a very interesting read, very um, worthwhile. I enjoyed it a lot, and um it's it's really interesting because it's like a feminist reclamation of this pay, play that was. Uh, kind of ignored this female character. It was three characters. One of them was a woman, and she just did not get to talk that much, <laughs> which uh, kind of sucks. So yeah, this this book came out of the the author actually performing that play and figuring out um, what, how getting into the character and saying, it, giving her a voice, basically giving her agency. And then uh, Sacred Country is actually a novel really very phenomenal it's it's got this um it the central character is martin ward but there's lots of different characters and it all is just basically a breakdown of this the whole the whole repress kind of repressed era of the 1950s and what that did to people and how people fought against that which was really cool Sounds great. It's always good to learn about new things that I can go read once I finally have time, now that we all will maybe have a little bit of time done the finals. Um, wonderful job, all of our panelists. Anyone else have any closing questions or questions for each other? All right. Well, thank you all. We really appreciate you sharing your work. Thank you, audience, for coming, you know, at the end of the quarter or on a Friday. Um, and thank you, Caitlin, if you are still here for setting this up. We will turn it back over to you. And if you have family members or uh, people who want to watch this, I believe that we'll have a video up on the conference website where they can check that out at their leisure. So I hope you all have a lovely weekend and a lovely summer. And we'll see some of you back in the fall, except for maybe not Emma. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> Congratulations on graduating seniors. Thank you. All right, see ya.